Let's see. Trying to move stuff around here. <clears throat> see if anybody comes along. This week's adventures. I got to look at several different ponds. Mm. Probably saw about 10 different ponds this week. I'm doing a little bit of consulting and probably heading back up to Georgia. I'm getting an <clears throat> alert to my own phone that I am live. I knew that. Thanks. Hey, there's somebody. Welcome aboard. Today's, tonight's topic is ponds, consulting people about ponds, um, just in general, from small ponds to, I mean, anywhere up to, one of them was 15 acres, one of them was five acres, a few of them are very small, uh, every size pond in between. Three folks joined. Welcome aboard. I said, pawns. Have had any experience dealing with water mill before? I've had to do quite a bit of aquatic weed control on small bodies of water over the years. And water mill is one of the tougher plants I've had to deal with. I saw some of that this week. Saw a lot of normal um, bass heavy, bass crowded situations. It's pretty standard these days. And by these days, I mean for like the last 20 or 25 years, pretty, pretty regularly see um, bass or predator crowded conditions in small impoundments. Uh, throughout, mm, you could safely say the southeastern United States. That's where I've primarily done most of my work. Although I have been as far west as Montana and as far north as Chicago. It's interesting seeing ponds, how things change, you know, from one area of the country to another. That's for sure. Um, the things that are happening in the Midwest are not happening in the Southeast. Pretty big discrepancy between, um, I guess management strategies would be the best way to, best way to term, term that. I don't know, is the chat not working or are you guys just not talking? Hey, there it goes. For some reason, I had to turn it on live chat this time. It, oh, it was on top chat. I don't know what that means. What's up, Frank? Big Malone, what's up, boys? Jimbo's next weekend? Oh, yeah, that is a good question. Um, Maybe. That's a maybe. Because I've got to go. Well, I've got some ponds i got to look at, and I was planning on next weekend, but you never know how that stuff goes, you know. Things fall through, stuff happens. We'll definitely hit you up if I'm there, though. <clears throat> uh, good question, Frank. Um, so, grass carp do not eat water meal. Um, Grass carp have like a subterminal mouth, right? Um, it's pointed down like a bottom feeder kind of would be. And grass carp don't, they're not an end all be all solution to, you know, controlling all weeds in all situations. You know, nothing is really. Um, so, like we're using grass carp in the pond, so we can use that kind of like real time experience. I like I like doing that, I'm not using hypothetical book stuff. And um, you know, we've had some some marginal, we've had some like cattails around the edge, 
just not too worried about those because Clint has kind of an army of people who could just literally chop those down by hand and get rid of them. Um, you could also do treatments on them as well, but they're not growing out of control or blocking any fishing access or, you know, um, inhibiting the pond in a negative way. So we let some patches of the cattails grow, you know, and we had some uh, primrose in there. Ducks brought it to us, I'm sure. And uh, since the cat, the uh, grass carp did a really good job controlling all the other plants, they, they really do a good job on soft plants that, that grow off the bottom. Um, like the kind of the pond weeds, there's many hundreds of varieties of like pond weed and uh, branched algae called Cara that we had in there. Um, but I guess anything that grows off the bottom of the pond that they, their, their subterminal mouth can kind of get above and eat down on. Whereas like duckweed and water meal are floating on the surface. So it's kind of opposite of how they want to feed. So um, even if they could feed on it, though, the problem with water meal and duckweed and the floating, um, most of the floating plants, really, uh, water fern, hyacinth, uh, lettuce, water lettuce, I can think of those off the top of my head. Anyway, um, grass carp, no grass carp, don't control any of those um, because they're floating. So um, that's where you get into a situation where you could have grass carp and you could also have a plant in your, on your lake that's still causing you a problem. Um, disrupting, you know, fishing or irrigation or something. Um, that's definitely possible. And it's definitely possible to have to treat uh, ponds that have been stocked with grass carp for some other types of aquatic weed problems. Um, that's very normal. I've done that very, a bunch of times. And it's usually algae. So when you kind of shift away from the plant growth on the bottom, it, it'll usually shift to planktonic and filamentous algae. Let me go back to um, questions and stuff. Oh, but Pete's back. Um, well, Pete, again, the, we've talked about this several times, and I just think you're not listening at this point. But um, the biologists are treating kind of what they need to treat to keep the plant populations from killing the fish. Okay, too many plants kill the fish. So the biologists measure the amount of plant growth and they also do electrofishing surveys and measure the fish growth every year um, all over the country, every state. And they can see the fluctuations in the fish populations based on measurements. So they go by what they measure, you know, and it's not a perfect system, you know, because there are politicians and, and uh, you know, bureaucracy kind of things. And, and I don't even really work in that world. It's not, I work, I work on private property for private lake owners and pond owners. But, um, you know, there's limitations, you know, drawbacks to everything. But I know those guys, they're like colleagues of mine, and they certainly do the best job that they can do within the confines of their jobs. And they're good dudes. You know, they're not like evil guys twisting their mustache trying to ruin fisheries. They're quite the opposite. They um, they love fish and fishing and fisheries management and do the best jobs that they can do. So, um, you know, I guess that's my response to that. What's up, Michael? Thanks for joining.
Yeah. I'm not explaining anything else to you, Pete. I don't have to. I do appreciate the engagement. Positive or negative, like I said, it drives the algorithm. So, um, you know, I'll continue to answer any questions that anybody has. But this week's, um, let's see, this week, basically, I had to look at a bunch of different little types of ponds and different situations on ponds from South Georgia to Central Florida, a couple of places I had to go. And you see a lot of similar things, a lot of similar patterns. And I did a video on it. Um, did I post? I think I posted that today. I worked on it for a day or two. My editing's bad. I'm slow and old and don't understand um, most of this stuff. <laughs> so it is what it is there. But I do have a lot of cool like field projects, you know, stuff coming up in the field that I can film well enough that everybody can see. And um you know, kind of get a feel for what it's like to do like a pond consulting trip from my point of view. They're, they get real redundant and real similar over and over and over again. It's the same things over and over and over again. <clears throat> um, same questions kind of fall over and over and over again. And like, if you pay attention to the chat here with the new people, you'll see the same questions. I know like with Frank and Mike and Big Malone, a bunch of the dudes that are here have always seen this stuff play out over and over and over again. Um, and I've been doing it for 30 years with new folks. It's it's a pretty normal pattern of behavior people have um, with how their questions go. But anyway, um, I had another kind of very similar pattern of behavior. And not knocking or anything. It's just a very normal um, interaction with, you know, doing some consulting on ponds and trying to explain to people, all right, you've got, uh, you know, too many bass. You're bumped a little too far in the bass heavy direction. How we adjust down and, and the numbers of fish that you want to pull. Um, the numbers of fish necessary to pull, I guess, if you don't, if you keep one or two bass, you really don't change anything, you know, or 10 bass or, or, you know, how many bass is enough bass, you know, in a 15 acre pond, you know, how many do you need to take? You guys know that if you had a 15 acre pond, you had just, just a few too many bass, say 11 to 12 inches or 11 to 14s. And I said, we did everything we caught was 11 to 14 inches. And look at my magic ruler. Look at them. <clears throat> look at the red numbers. They did, they got red for a reason. You know, those are the those are the fish you got to watch the most. And every single fish that we caught was in that range. And every single fish we caught was under those numbers. Skinny. So ponds and big lakes are extremely similar because both most most ponds are man-made. Most big lakes are man-made. They're artificial systems with aquatic environments in them, Pete. Um, the fact that you don't understand anything about pond management says quite a lot because it's the absolute basics. This is just literally like bass and bluegill, right? So if you can't understand the basics of a simple one predator, one prey species, and then say add one other species or two other species in, in a pond environment and then watch the behaviors there. There's no possible way that you could ever understand like a 36 species, 150,000 acre reservoir where all those different species are interacting, you know, with one another in different ways when you don't even understand the basics of two of, of a pond uh, simply put you have to crawl before you walk my friend and that's why we sit here and talk about pond management 
so we can understand these relationships and fish population dynamics and expand them off and into bigger and better place. I don't, I'm not explaining anything to you, Pete. I don't have to do anything. No. I'm going to figure out how to block, I think. That's what I think I'm going to do with Pete. I'm not explaining anything except, you know, kind of the point of the the, the live that I'm doing right now is, is pond management. This is for pond managers and people who manage ponds. And, um, this will help a lot more people than trying to explain some hypothetical thing about lakes that I don't even manage. I don't manage those lakes. I manage ponds and, awesome, and small lakes. I do a good job at it too. Um, that being said, I've been to several thousand of them over the last 30 years. I've run electrofishing surveys on them. I've run, um, you know, like net surveys where you, you sample fish in different manners, um, you know, by netting and, and sampling, looking at the at, um, the reproduction of the fish. And um, I found similar results over and over and over and over again, you know, very similar results. There's only just a couple of different ways ponds end up, their populations kind of all go into the same directions. And that's what gave me the idea to do the page because um, there's a lot of people kind of stuck, you know, with a pond and it's, you know, uh, it's an expense. It's an outside expense, you know, above and beyond, you know, if you inherit a pond or you have family property with a pond or whatever, um, it certainly can be expensive to, to manage them. So I ran into a lot more people who didn't have, you know, a lot of extra money to manage a pond. That's why I thought about doing it here and doing, doing it on YouTube because, or on social media in general, because a lot of people can watch it and it really doesn't cost me any business. If, you know, somebody who can't afford to pay you, um, and it'll help people with palm management. And that's why I don't really care about the headwaters or Lake Michigan or, um, and whatever things else you guys went to sky wants to talk about because it doesn't have to do with ponds my job where my expertise lies questions that i can actually you know answer I, questions that i've answered i know with truthful facts based on my job don't seem to matter so talking about things that i'm not as clear about doesn't seem to won't really won't matter either um we'll keep it on the point and stay with pond management for today but that being said, um, the answer to the question that I asked was about in a 10 acre pond, you're going to need to pull about 200 one pound bass out before you start taking enough bass. And that's assuming they're skinny. They're all 11 to 14 inches and they're underweight. It's also assuming there's no crappy or other predators in the pond, which this pond didn't have. These ponds didn't have. They were stocked well. They were just a little out of balance. So we can bump that balance in the other direction. It's very much like a seesaw. Um, just take a few bass off one side and the other side will go up. And just remove and it's it's very it's simple and it's easier to in a pond, you know, it's an easier thing to manage. <clears throat> um When you start adding different species of predators, all and a lot of people do a lot of species, different species of, of prey into a pond too, um, which I really don't recommend. I like bluegill alone in ponds. They take the feed, they spawn real well, gotten great growth with our bass, you know, in the example pond the last two years, several bass over four pounds um, in two years, just on bluegill. So you don't need a, a big diverse 
population of different forage fish in a pond to get your bass to grow. What you need is very consistent supply of protein all throughout the growing season to get your bass to grow. And that's what's happened to these ponds that have a few too many bass like we saw uh, this week. Um, excuse me. They have a few too many bass. So kind of like being putting too many, um, too many uh, cows on pasture. You know, if you put enough cows on a pasture, you don't have to mow it. If you don't put enough, the pasture will still grow up. Cows will be, you know, out there. The few cows you have will be doing fine. If you put too many cows, you know, the cows will die of malnutrition because there's not enough grass to support the cows. And the exact same thing works for the bass population. Um, they're just feeding over a pasture of bluegill in this scenario. Oh, Southeast Kayak. What's up, man? Yeah, Southeast Kayak has been following for quite a while, and he's been uh, learned about how to, you know, manage relative weight or how to measure relative weight and how to manage ponds with it. And he's just saying that um, the last couple of years he's been doing selective harvest on some ponds and he's seeing an increase in his relative weights. Yeah, man, it's really simple math. It's just, you know, two plus two is four. Um, it's not hard to understand. There's some, sometimes you can't get through, you know, some man you just can't reach, but yeah. Um, if you just look at it and, and like, and when you learn how to measure it, you know, um, and, and then when you do like, like uh, you learn how to measure it first. Right. And you're like, you understand that it's a measurement and, um, then you learn how to like, like in this situation, say we go out, we saw these ponds and we saw this one 10 acre pond. It's full of uh, 11 to 14 inch bass that are all like 80 to maybe 90% relative weight at best. You go get the 200 bass out of it. You come back the next year and you see the bass that are left are now 98% relative weight, 95% relative weight. You know, you, you see a significant increase in the, girth on the bass that are left and then the other interesting thing that you'll see is even though that you've removed bass you've lowered you know you've you know relatively taken probably like a third of the bass population out your catch rates will actually go up because your bass population has more energy those all the fish that are left in there are more well fed and had the energy kind of to burn to to hunt to move around um once they kind of get to the spot where they're all stuck in that 12 inch range um they don't have the energy to burn they don't and and they get very selective about what they're eating as well because that's usually very keyed into all real small things their forage base is their forage isn't very diverse because it's basically being consumed as fast as it's born so it's usually always small. Oh, Pete, give me a break. The Headwaters is a brand new lake, and we've gone over this 150 times. Orange Lake is throwing off 16 pounders because Mother Nature kind of drained it down to almost nothing, and it grew back. It came back, and it's full, and the DNR did a real good job balancing it on whatever they did to help restore it there, and it's throwing off 16-pound bass, but it's basically like a new lake. Um, if we go west from here, Bussy Break is about a four-year-old impoundment over there, and it's throwing off 12-pounders. MLF broke every single record that they could possibly break in the fourth year because it's a new lake. Go further west to Texas to OH Ivy. It's again, multiple fish over 10 pounds. The guides over there are cranking it out, absolutely killing it. Exact same situation as Orange Lake. It was drought, almost drain dry, 
came back, it's experiencing new lake effect. And the headwaters are also a brand new lake in South Florida. I don't even think it's 10 years old yet, is it? No, new lake effect. Big new reservoirs throw off fish. Don't get used to it. It'll go away. We've gone over it like 150 times on here. The idea of what we're doing right now actually tie that into the pond that I'm managing. It was a brand new pond. It was dug from scratch and built there. So we've stocked a new fish population on new soil like that. And that's exactly what we've captured is, is new lake effect. And that's why I'm a part of the reason why the bass are growing as well as they are, because it is a new pond and a big part of the reason why I recommend that people, if you have a pond and you really want good fishing for a good 10 year period, just drain it and start it over again from scratch. Um, when you expose the bottom soil to the air and let that dry out, um, it's, it's actually really good for the bottom of the pond. And it allows you to kind of capture this part of that, how that new lake effect occurs is the, revitalization of the soil on the bottom of the pond being exposed to air. Um, so, yeah, I don't know about my experience being limited, Pete, but. It's just that um, I don't work for the state. Okay, so back to kayak. Um, I see relative weight go up with sufficient structure in it so the bass don't have very much to feed. Okay, so, so where we're getting here now is like, okay, so when, um, uh, it's, it's hard to explain. How do I put this? When the balance gets so far off, towards um bass heavy southeast the structure part is not going to matter that much because it's kind of like having a sniper behind every tree if you were playing a war game right when the bass population gets too crowded the cover is either too much or not enough i guess is the best way to put it right the the, the cover and the habitat balance part of that is really important after you get the predator prey ratio correct okay so it's kind of like this like you know when you shoot a rifle like if you sight in a rifle and it's like you can bore sight the rifle and then you can take the rifle and then you know further kind of fine tune the sight in after the bore sight the bore sight will get you close right and then you, you fine tune it later that's kind of the what i'm trying to explain there same thing the i see a lot of guys do it too they worry about the structure in the lake but they're they've got 70 80 90 bass per acre they got some sort of ridiculous you know you, we want to be hunting down around the 45 bass per acre you know 50 45 40 depending on again depending on the habitat where you're at where you're located whatever and they've say got like 58 bass per acre. So it's like, okay, the first thing you need to do is bring 10 bass per acre down, you know, and in a one acre pond, that's easy. You just go catch 10 one pounders, but in 700 acres of water, that's a different ball game. Right. So it just depends on the scale of the small impoundment to, as to how much work is even possible to do for one person, two people, a hundred people, depending if you have a club involved or whatever. But that's where a lot of our small impoundments are going to lie, where there's the problems going to lie is like, okay, say there's me and you and Malone and, you know, Frank and all the rest of us here want to go help the lake. And we know we need to keep the bass, but we can't keep that many, you know, we can't go keep 7,000 even if the regular state regulations allowed it, you know, you physically just couldn't go do it anyway. 
So you'll have challenges like that too. Like we can go talk about big lake management all you want to, um, but we can actually manipulate the ponds. You know, I've actually gone and done what I'm saying here. Like I've gone and taken 20 bass per acre out and watched and seen what's happened over a 10 year period in a pond because it's something that you can observe. It's small, it's controllable, you know? So I think you can learn a lot from ponds. Um, and I think there's been a lot of research done on ponds that people already have done a lot from ponds. That's basically all I'm telling you guys is the stuff that's already been proven. Um, I didn't prove any of it. I didn't do these research projects. Guys who got PhDs did this stuff. I'm just telling you what I read about. Does that make sense, Southeast? You kind of have to get the bass population down, right? So you like today, you know, or um, yesterday when I was looking at those ponds, like this bass population is is just all skewed high, right? And everybody else is. It's no big deal. Everybody's is that way. So we go pull them. And um, now after we got the, the bass population down and we're start like you've explained, you're starting to see a bump in the relative weight. You've seen improvements in the relative weight. All right, now start with your brush piles and your blowdowns, your rock piles. Your Now's the time to fine tune it, right? Don't try to fine tune it when you've got 15 bass per acre too many, because it doesn't matter how well you fine tune it. You're still shooting off over here, you know, uh, you're way off on the balance part of it. So it's balance at first, then fine tune the habitat. And when you get those two things together, then you start getting real special fisheries, you know, um, and sometimes and I mean, a lot of times too, man, fisheries are just special because they are. You know, because there's, I don't know what it is. Just some places are just better than others. <clears throat> Frank, I get trolls sometimes, Frank. I get yard trolls and I get, um, I got boat troll. There's a boat troll currently messing with everything that floats in my yard. I don't know what his problem is, but like, you guys have those experiences, man, where like the freaking trolls come and mess with your stuff. <clears throat> I don't even know what question I'm trying to answer, dude. New lakes, Pete. They're all new lakes. All the every headwaters is a new place. It puts out good fish and actually go measure them because the last few times I've seen some relative weight calculations out of there, it looks like it's it's in year five and already getting a little crowded with fish which I've seen in my small ponds many, many times. Um, you stock 50 bass per acre and you let those, those go without at pure catch and release, just let the natural reproduction come in, let the bass population spawn up. It's usually about four years and uh, the bass population is significantly growing slower than it should be just due to crowded bass. Uh, well, it's exactly what I just described and did a video on too and talk about and measured all the time for 30 years. So it's the same old song and dance, boys. Um, different parts of the world. Um, these, the, the, I saw some ponds that way that were in Central Florida. I saw some ponds that way that were in South Georgia. I saw some ponds that way in Northeast Georgia, South Carolina. And Southern North Carolina, all with just in the past month, maybe six weeks. Mm. We are going to have a electro fishing jobs. Um, we're going to do electro fishing on the pond. Uh, one of the kids, uh, Garrett, that follows the page has a pinnacle um, lake management. And he does that type of, of service where he goes around and does some electro fishing. So we're going to have him on discuss that stuff and, uh, and have him do it, have him look at the pond, have him electro fish. And, uh, I'm going to film all that 
that'll be nice. It'll be good to be able to, to film from my perspective and not have to do the work just to be able to like capture the, the, the stuff without having to do the actual work and film yourself. That's harder to do than it looks. I leave cameras everywhere. I left the camera at the pond. I've got to go back to the pond next week, actually. So we're going to do another, um, another go at trying to get the drone up, get some, get some better footage of that. Uh, irrigation stuff and how that, how that system works like a pump back kind of system where the, the water is, is used uh, in many different ways at Sugar Hill for fish and irrigation and everything else. Um, and continue to tie in, like uh, going back to what we were talking about, new lake effect. Um, these big reservoirs can grow fish really fast. Like um, there was a hundred acre lake that grew a 13 pounder in about four years in South Georgia. And uh, that was documented with electro fishing surveys by the state. So we can kind of, that's kind of like the bigger the place, the bigger the pond you're stocking, the better chances you have at growing a big fish because it takes so much forage for a big bass to grow. And it's harder to do the smaller the bodies of water, but we can still kind of mimic, and we are mimicking that growth now. I mean, we've got fish over, we had two growing seasons, they're over four pounds. So by this time next year, we should have fish, uh, you know, seven pound range in three years in a two and a half acre pond, you know, um, that's grown really, really well and comparable to what you would see at headwaters or any of these other bigger lakes. Um, we just have a microcosm, you know, a, a, a very much smaller version of that. So we had to be hyper aware of our fish population densities and control them to keep the fish growing at optimal rates. Um, they can certainly overcrowd and over spawn and mess us up. Um, Southeast Kayak says he wants the state of Georgia to go to a 10 inch length on keepers. Yeah. And Southeast, I think, um, Tim, the clockwork elves, that's a good one, dude. Um, they are the clockwork elves, the troll, the troll elves come to my, and they usually, they usually hate my boat for some reason. I don't know why, but it's usually boat things. It's usually trolling motor boat things too specifically but anyway um yeah southeast and the problem um uh, the next there's a next thing down the line from these regulations it's like everybody wants to talk regulations everybody wants to shout at the dnr and, and kind of point fingers at the dnr that happens to those guys a lot and um the, I don't think it would matter what they change the rules to when you've got a population of fishermen that aren't keeping any fish and aren't, I've, I've seen this in my job again, how do we use ponds to see how it would happen with lakes? Well, it's really easy. I had guys that would pay me thousands of dollars to come and conduct electro fishing on their pond and do the fancy survey and for a 20 year period. I did this over and over and over again and you go and you talk to them just like we're talking now. And you, and just exactly like happened today when I was doing the fishing experiment, I did it with electro fishing boat instead. So it costs a lot more money. And I told the guy, you need to take out 201 pound bass out of the system. And then we'll come back again next year and we'll get some fish up and we'll measure. And then we'll see, you know, kind of where we need to go from there. And then the next year would come along and you would guy would call you back. Yep. Yeah, bring the boat back up, you know, come do the whole thing again, do it all again and get, you know, how many, how many bass did you take out last year? And it was almost a hundred, almost like over 90% of the time, none, zero. So you can change the laws all you want is the, is the point of the story. Um, if the people don't keep the fish anyway, they're just throwing them back um, and they need to be harvested. The laws are relevant. They're, you're, they're not going to matter. Um, and that's what I saw trying to manage. It's, it's not getting people to throw them back. It's getting people to keep them 
that is the real challenge. And then, um, I mean, several times over the past few days when I tell people, okay, you need to take a hundred, a hundred bass, a hundred bass out of that. Is there even a hundred bass in that? You know, I mean, again, all the same things I've heard all for years, all the same. And I think that's part of the problem because you can't see how many bass are actually drifting around in there. You're relying on, on the tape measure, you know, you're relying on the data on the page. And I guess that's why I keep preaching to everybody, go measure these, write this down, look at it on paper because it jumps out at you like a loss on a spreadsheet, you know, like a, or a loss on your business. When you learn how to read it on paper, when you actually see the data, when you see the relative weights written out there in a line, it's like, okay, obviously these fish are in poor health and these fish are in better health you could like literally see it on the page and that helps. I think um, it also helps too, like being able to see Sugar Hill Outdoors Pond and see that how much bigger, like their, their fish are running 110, 120% relative weight real consistently, you know, real just healthy, thick fish and look at being able to look over there and go, okay, that's what those fish look like. They look good. You know, what do my fish look like? And then that for me, like doing it in the field, I guess is what I'm trying to explain is, is different. You know, when you, when you can go to a pond and the fish are growing great and the fish are looking great compared to a pond where the fish are not growing great and not looking great. And you see both of those things side by side on the same day, then it really, it really begins to click for you. Frank's coming through again. Um, Frank's choking again. Frank's a joker. So he's going to do Ospreys. That's, that would work. I mean, you know, if you wanted to clean everybody out, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how you're going to make any money, but in the Comorots, man, the Comorots are brutal. They can kill. They can really, I've seen them really, really injure. Um, and you got to consider it too, man. The Comorots are the worst because they always come in in the fall, you know, and they migrate. So you can have this lovely spring. You can have your feeders going. Everything's working. You know, your fish are growing. <laughs> Everything's right. It looks like a Disney movie. The birds are chirping and, and flying around. You know what I mean? The deer are drinking the water. It's absolutely an idealistic, perfect place for months. And then the Comoros get there. And uh, it becomes a it becomes a horror movie. It becomes the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and the funny thing is too, sometimes it's like, um, sometimes they're so, cause the thing about it is, is the fish, the fish are, are unnaturally heavy, unnaturally slower too. Un, and it's not like they can get away from the Comorots and the predatory birds. Anyway, those underwater swimmers are brutal. And um, they can they can just absolutely decimate you, just light you up. And generally, where those problems occur is around ponds that are kind of on a flyway near a major reservoir, um, because the comrades will will flock together. So if they're flying from down the rivers and and down like kind of hopping from rivers to major reservoirs and, and one of those type of flyway areas. Um, you'll have a worse problem with the Comorots. And I've seen it man, a few, a few times, not a bunch of times, but a few times where, man, they just, it's like, where'd the fish go? Like what happened? <laughs> Take you a minute to figure it out. Yeah. Butchers.
Okay, so Southeast Kayak says he says he could catch a hundred one pound bass every day for the next two months in one of the ponds he manages. It's ridiculous. Yeah, oh, I know, man. That's yep. You named it right there. So um for anybody, you know, listening who's new or you know, today's theme is is managing bass populations in ponds. And the big mystery is sometimes bass spawn too much. That's the part you never hear from anybody on TV or anything is like, what happens when the bass spawn or what happens when the bass spawn twice? You guys notice that one in Georgia. Anyway, we'll get two spawns. We'll get one in the fall sometimes. So that's totally possible. Could happen in our pond this year. We could see it could, it could have just happened. I might have not, not even have noticed it. You know, we might see it um, say in the electro fishing survey next year, we'll, we'll see like a, a size of bass fry that doesn't make sense, you know, because if they were born every, say, um, April, you should be able to to count the numbers of seasons. You know, we see this one is, you know, if it's if it's May and we see a one inch one, we knew it was born a month ago. We see a you know eight inch one or whatever, we knew it was born last May. But if we saw one in between the two sizes, and it would indicate a fall spawn or an, actually an awful late one in the summer, which you'll see some of that too. So yes, catch and release is important. Yes. You need to follow all your local regulations on anything that is recommended as far as leasing, uh, catch and releasing fish and or fish consumption. But just know that also that if you have a pond to manage, you need to keep some fish sometimes too, because of the reproductive success some years. There's another side of balance that we use the term balance in pond management. And it's very much like balance, like a bicycle. You can lean a bicycle one way and still ride it, you know, kind of lean and you can stay balanced and lean a bicycle another way. You can't lean it too much in either direction, but still it is balanced that way. And a pond balance is that way too. We can kind of balance it towards one fish or another fish. As long as we stay within the parameters of, you know, a healthy ecosystem, we can kind of help it along. Um, and when you get too many bass, you're just balanced, you're balanced predator heavy. You're just kind of leaning the bike one way. And, you know, in a pond, you can just move back the other way. In a bigger lake, again, it goes back to what we were just talking about. Okay, say we've got a 10,000 acre lake in Mill, Georgia, that has too many 11 to 14 inch bass and they actually need every single bass club to keep every single bass they catch out of that lake for the next three seasons just to come close to the numbers of bass that need to be removed do you think you could get every single person who fishes a lake a 10,000 acre lake in, in the state of georgia to cooperate in something like that you know do we think we have that level of communication with fishermen that that, that could be communicated because I can promise you, we don't, I've been doing it in ponds for 30 years. I can't even get one guy to keep 200, you know? So that's the challenge. That, that's where our fisheries lie. The challenge lies for the health of our fisheries in the future. It's not the releasing of the fish. And it's certainly not people being motivated to throw money at it. Stocking wise, we've got plenty of that too. Uh, what happens when just straight up keeping fish is what is what they need. And what do we do now? Sterile flatheads. I'm going with John's idea. I'll just go with picker predators. You know, people aren't going to do, they're not going to listen. You know, I can promise you that no matter we can sit here and talk about this all day long. People won't listen that we can bet on. Um, so yeah, John's idea is just go get a big flathead, like a 60 pound predatory flathead catfish or a hundred pound or like those things can get to be 150 pounds. So those, they're beast fish. And then they, they're ster they'd be sterile. So they can't grow over and take over the lake. And then they would go in there and just waylay all the one pound bass. Um, on paper, you know, that would work. 
that that would work and you know what else it would look like too it would take it to like a northern lake kind of thing where you know you got northern pike you got musky uh you got tiger musky and lake trout and all those are different kinds of, of fish in northern lakes um another level of predator above bass and see, that's another that's another thing I run into online all the time, too, is dudes wanting to kind of compare these different places. I touched about it when I was at the lock the other day. It's like you want to talk about big lake management. OK, well, there's a big lake right out there. It's got bull sharks, crabs, flounder, tarpon. You know, it's got a it's got a channel that goes out to the to uh, the St. John's River which not very far, maybe an hour further past that, it's in the Atlantic Ocean. So, yeah, the amount of uh, competing things going on in Rodman Reservoir, you know, learning how to manage Rodman Reservoir isn't going to help you with a pond at all. Um, freaking sea turtles and stuff. <laughs> Hook life. What's up? Let me get back to the questions. I'm running my yap. Bow, bow, bow. Pond management business. Good luck with that, Frank. Frank says he's going into pond management, and I will pray for you there, my friend. That is a um, tough business. Oh, uh, Phillip's on here. He's doing... Um, for anybody who's new and following along, 10 folks, hey, welcome aboard, everyone. Um, Philip is real good at keeping up with relative weights and becoming very good. Because again, what he's been writing that number down, he's been looking at that number on a piece of paper, and he has been um, very good at understanding, seeing the correlation between the numbers of the data and what's actually going on in the field and that's talent that some people just can't learn even people who go to fishery school i've seen that actually several times they can't correlate the number they can't correlate the page to the field um and philip has done an excellent job of using measurements to understand what's going on biologically and uh he said he's doing a real on severely underweight 15 inch bass. That's good, Philip. You're doing a fine job, sir. Frank is, is now f selling fish emulsion fertilizer to marijuana grow ops, which that is that's actually got some. It's probably got some legs you could get behind there. Probably the fish emulsion fertilizer works awesome. Uh, another reason, another thing you could use all these one pound bass you need to take out of your pond. If you're out there in the world wondering what on earth you're going to use a one pound bass and you don't eat it or whatever, uh, put it in the garden, man. Use it as fertilizer. It's stupid. It's stupid how good they grow stuff. All right. Hook life's back here. So, oh, wait. Miss Tim comment too. Oh, uh, Tim was just saying about, you know, I mean, kind of oblivious to how choline worked in his pond and how it's so beneficial. Yeah, it really is, man. Um, if you just get into a simple habit of making it, you know, making it happen early in the year, get it out of your way, make it like one of your chores, you know, um, you'll have a much healthier fish population in your pond. And uh, it's actually, you know, a really good source of, I don't know, what are the, um, the, the, the people down the um, organic or, or not, it's not vegan. That's not the right term because that's we vegetables, but um, like or, organic protein, you know, um un, uh wild caught that's another that's another good way to put it um your bass would be wild caught and organic purely you know locally grown locally grown organic that's another way to, that you could f kind of phrase that 
and uh, excuse me um some of the things i see it like the 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 food stores the and when I wander off into the Whole Foods and stuff like that, you see signs like that. And that's, a, that's what it reminds me of. Locally grown organic is like venison to me. <clears throat> yeah, Hook, I agree with you. He says um, he thinks there's just way too many people hardwired to catch and release. It's the only way to go. And um, yes, I agree. He says I think there needs to be, you know, just a cultural shift through knowledge. And <clears throat> um, I don't know, man. I just do the best that I can do. You know, I agree. I, I try to spread knowledge, but you get blowback all the time. You know, you get people who just don't want to listen or just enjoy arguing or whatever. Um, more than you get, you know, positive vibes. And it's funny, the bigger it gets, like the smaller the group is, it's like you can kind of have like a, a nice small group, but as the group goes 15, goes 20,000, starts goes 25,000, that it seems like the, the negativity seems to compound a little bit. But I guess that probably also has to do with just the num sheer numbers of people who are kind of seeing what's going on. Um, you know, whatever, man. I know that I know what I measured. You know, and I and I know what I did at work. You know, I'm confident in what I did at work and measured repeatedly many, many times over again. Um, so it's the truth. It's easy to tell the truth. You know, you just tell people what you saw. And then what happens is, is there's enough people on here that it happens to them, too. It's their pawn. You know, it's a situation that they're in. And then they're like, that guy's. He, that you help them out, you know, it, it hooks them up, you know, and this has happened a bunch of times in the last three or four years. And then, um, then once you got people, once you've helped people that way, you know, and, and then something else comes down the line and they'll come back to you and, uh, and you would just build, you know, you build good working relationships that way just by, um, just by simply being honest really is what it comes down to. Oh, Frank's got a good question, and he's not kidding this time. So no jokes from Frank this time. Has anyone ever tried a fish that's um, one sex only? Yeah, dude. Um, I've actually worked on a few ponds like that before, and they're female bass only ponds. Um, the last one that I saw was this guitar player named Derek Trucks. Um, I met him, I don't know, maybe about a year ago at his place. He's got a place in, in middle Georgia, and – I kind of filed that away to, to the page. I was trying to do Patreon back then and I didn't really post too much about it on Instagram. Um, so I just did that on, on Patreon. I don't know if you followed on there or not, but that's where that information went. But I closed the Patreon down. I'm trying to get it going on YouTube. It seems more logical place to try to earn revenue is YouTube. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is the last, the last place I saw, well, I've seen two recently. One was um, rock stars and one was um, the Mossy Oak dudes got one kind of hidden back in the woods in um, Mississippi when I was out there on that podcast with Mossy Oak Gamekeepers. Um, we had a good conversation about female bass only and, you know, how that how that plays out. And that's that brings up a really good point, too, because like we know in, in Sugar Hill Outdoors Pond that the there's a hundred bass in there because I'm 108, but uh, six or so of dies. So we're probably down to about 102 and take off a few more, maybe a hundred. Well, you don't know. I just, just poured this everywhere. I don't know how much is this glass must be leaking. Oh no, it's just indented down there. It must have been had ice on the bottom of it. Just dropped, just it soaked me. That's uncomfortable. Uh 
All right. Sorry about that, boys. Fumble on play. Dogs recovered, though, so it's all good. All right, so what was I, I wasn't even talking about? I lost completely lost my train of thought on that. Let me go back to Tim. Um, talk about culling is obvious. Yep. Cultural shift to knowledge from hook like. Yep. Speaking of the spawn. Oh, yeah, female bass only. That's what we were talking about. Um, so, yeah, I've seen female bass only. And going back to Sugar Without Doors, we stocked 100. Well, just mathematically, we rolled the dice. Only 50 of them. Um, if, if the sexes of the fish break evenly could be 10 pounders would be even be female in that pond. So that's one way you can look at it. Um, a lot of these guys try to stock them in the ponds where they can control the numbers of bass and there's absolutely no bass reproduction going on. That's cool and all, but that seems kind of like those types of ponds are where you don't have a stream fed, you don't have that type of control are not very common, like a, a groundwater fed type pond that stays full. Um, it takes special kind of a place, special kind of land, special kind of watershed. They definitely exist. I've definitely managed them. That's the kind of pond you would want for an all female bass. You wouldn't want a stream coming in. But even if I had a stream coming in and could pretty much count on some male bass coming in and, you know, messing up my all-female population over a long period of time, I wouldn't be worried about it because on the initial stocking of all females, that still doubles the chances of, you know, normally half those fish would never be 10, would never be over five pounds or male, you know. So... I can see using them both ways and it's kind of new too. So I haven't even had, you know, maybe you can think of another way that, that you could use an all female bass population, but um, now all one fish population in the same pond and grown out is like aquaculture. They, they grow catfish. They grow all the fish at the fish hatcheries that way. All the, the fish are together. They're not mixed in with predators. It'd be very foolish to mix in your the the catfish or the or, or the bluegill you're trying to grow for profit with bass. The bass would eat them up, eat everything you got, real quick, like too. So the the fish hatchery keeps you know pre, you know bass are in their own place, brim are in their own place, catfish in their own place, so on and so forth. They're not mixed together usually. Um, I say because bass are stone hammers. You don't want them on the fish you're trying to sell. They'll eat you up. Good one, Frank. You're pretty smart. You're not joking around. All female bass populations. Good job. Okay. Talks amongst yourself. Amongst yourself. Uh, Hook Life says he thinks... Oh, you think I should go on tour? Yeah, I think I should too, man. I think that's a great idea. I think whatever gives me some money, that would be good too. If I could just like talk about pawn stuff and like get some money, that'd be sweet. No, I just, uh, I really enjoy doing all this, man. Everything that's happened social media wise, I've learned a lot. It's been interesting. Um, I definitely didn't know you know, how to do a lot of this stuff and still don't, you know, I'm learning. Thanks for hanging with me and dealing with my bad editing and stuff. Uh, this, like I said, man, this would be so much better if, if I, I've seen YouTube videos, man, like sometimes people get enough followers that they can hire an editor and stuff, man, if I could ever get to where I don't have to do all everything, this channel will get a lot better. I've got a lot of good ideas, a lot of cool stuff. I have an unlimited amount of content that I could do, man. Um, I'm the limiting factor on that. If I had like, you know, I need like, well, it all just takes money, right? You need just people to, to pay that are experts at what they do. Like I'm good at growing fish and messing with ponds. There's people who are good at videos and, and doing that. So I guess forward looking, that would be the coolest thing I think that that could happen. If I could, if YouTube money would make me enough that I could edit like pay somebody to edit and we could have a good channel. 
not this hack job <laughs> throwing together. Uh, would be sweet. Frank's on a roll tonight, and he's. See, the, the weed farmers I know with the fish emulsion, they would definitely. One time, I'll tell you a funny story. My buddy Bart. Bart's got, yeah, I don't know if you guys have been following on the other pages and stuff. Bart's got a long, like, real long beard, you know? He's always had it, too. He's not like a fly by night beard guy. He's had, he's been rocking that thing since the 80s. But he had, he's into gardening, right? Um, he always has, like, the garden is always growing too, man. It's gone from like it's acres of garden now. It's it's getting ridiculous. But I remember this one time he had a garden uh, right right by next to his house. He lived at he had a pool and then like the fence outside. And I don't know, maybe like the first eight feet or so outside that fence was uh, soil, like nice top soil. All it's a garden. It was a straight up garden that hooked around the pool, turned an L. And I had a bunch of bass as usual because I always had them. And uh, I said, "Hey, man, you know we should we sh you should use these. Um, <laughs> you should use all these bass. It's like fifty or sixty of them. Um, so I don't have to clean them. We don't have to clean them and and get you know kind of get it get it out of that doing that. Um, we'll put them in your garden, you know, and then you just let them break down in there. And it was it was in the fall, you know, it was it was." <laughs> It was um, late in the fall, but it was in the fall. And he's like, sure, sure, yeah, that'd be a good idea. So we dug holes and buried them. And uh, I don't know when he decided to turn the the earth for his garden early that year, I guess. And it wasn't long enough after <laughs> we had buried the fish. And uh, quite, quite a bad, it was it's quite bad. It was quite, quite bad on, on the smell and the neighbors were mad and his wife was mad. Um, I think she was more mad at me than she was at him because she knew where he got the fish from. But I tell you what, you want to talk about some tall corn. That boy had corn. It looked like it was on steroids, man. Great corn that year. <laughs> Are we being censored by YouTube, Frank? Probably. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know what the rules are. I just assume I'm not supposed to use bad language and I'm not supposed to call anyone names. And um, I'm not supposed to, I don't think you're supposed to threaten anybody, but I don't know. There's like these things, like these things you check off that I'd never read about. Like you promised not to do a bunch of stuff. Uh, I didn't read that. But so I won't use any bad language and I won't call anybody any names and I'll just talk about going to work and stuff. And I think it'll be all right. I think it'll work out, you know, uh, it's what I did on the other one and I haven't gotten kicked off it yet. Not, well, at least as of seven o'clock, it's seven thirty now. So you never know. It's the future. <clears throat> Phillips Phillips concerned about the use of, of protected migratory birds, which you know he does have a valid point there, boys. You know, um, we might want to keep from making anything more endangered than it already is. Uh, good one, Philip. Oh, bulk quantity of fish emulsions, yeah, dude. Um, the first place that I would check for real on that boss is um, like bait suppliers. Like if you've got a local um, bait shop that, uh, you know, like any kind of bait, any shiners or crappy minnows or, or whatever kind of live bait that people use in your area, um, the bait shops around there will always have fresh dead bait. So, uh, and they'll be glad. I don't, 
most of the places that I ever grabbed it from were glad to have somebody to take the dead fish because they didn't want to have to deal with it. Um, but and you can learn how to make fish emulsions right here on YouTube. There's videos. I've I've done it before. Um, and then you can take it one step further than that, even if it's not the mom and pop, you know, quote unquote bait shop there's usually like a local distributor you might get lucky and have a bigger local bait distributor somewhere near your house and them boys will have <laughs> have dead fish by the ton uh fish that haul on trucks die a lot and um yeah try the try your local fish hatcheries to whatever to whatever um state you live in or you could just catch them use them for fertilizer Nothing illegal about that either. Tim, you like Derek Trucks, dude? I saw Derek Trucks. It was awesome meeting him too, man. And you want to talk? I met Derek, 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 and Susan on that trip up there to Georgia. They got a beautiful place, beautiful lakes, um, awesomely cool people. Some of the coolest people I've met have been musicians in this job, doing this job. Um, just for me personally, you know, everybody's different and likes a different, like, you know, everybody's unique in the world. But um, I would say like the coolest people that I've met have been musicians that are, are into um, pond management. I've been, I've been fortunate enough to meet several and um, they're always really smart, interesting people. Seems like. So I don't know sidebar, but yeah, Derek is a, uh, is a cool guy, man. Just as genuine as he comes across on everything that you've ever seen him on. You know, if you're a friend like me, I uh, first time I saw Derek, uh, was at the Georgia theater in Athens and shoot, shoot, let's see. I would have been maybe 21, 20, 21 years old. Not sure if I was even legal to drink when I saw him there, maybe just barely. So 90, three, four, sometime in there. Uh, and he was a young man, uh, maybe 15, 16 years old. He's a little younger than me. Um, but yeah, all those years ago, got saw, saw that young man, guitar prodigy for you guys who don't know, local, um, I believe he's Allman Brothers. Um, one of his relatives, I'm not, I don't know everything about the man, but um, I know Tedeschi Trucks, Van, um, him and Susan got to meet them and they are really just as nice of people as you've ever met and wish them all the best. If they happen to see this, um, Derek's brother, David also, um, he follows the page and, uh, is a real, real nice, real nice guy. Philip Cheek coming in and saying he was tardy. Well, that's that's okay, Phil. Um, you're here now. That's all that matters. It's the kind of teacher I would be, you know. If I was a teacher. Yeah, Phil. He's kind of been. Um, well, he's kind of been a theme actually of what's been going on. Um, the negativity seems to all sound alike. I guess. So, um, people pick, I don't know, um, I don't know how to put this. I don't, I'm not I'm good at articulating these kinds of things. I usually just generally ignore it, but, uh, he's been a consistently, you know, do, up to what he's up to over there. And, um, I find that the people like that, they don't really have any real experience in the field, you know? So that's why I try to keep it on the actual things that we have going really in the field, like your measurements. That's a perfect example. He's coming from Philip and Philip's going around, you know, everywhere he goes and measuring and teaching people how to measure fish health and doing a great job with it. And, um, you know, Philip, it's math. Two plus two is four. Right. And, when you learn to see it that way, it becomes very logical. It becomes very easy, you know, and um, 
you know, I just couldn't reach that guy. Can't, can't seem to get through to that uh, particular dude. And, and, um, and that's okay. Maybe one day I can, maybe one day and I'll never will be able to, you know, that's okay too. Um, you can't reach everyone. You can't help everyone, you know, but the whole idea of this is to try to help. And I have to say, um, he's one of the most engaging people. So like, if the people who are negative watch you more than the people who really like you. <laughs> so I'm just using that engagement to my advantage. Uh, it's racking up view hours and, uh, and I need them to get paid. So hate away. It's fine. None of this stuff hurts my feelings, man. I promise you. Yeah. I don't know what you're talking about, Phil. It's cool. <laughs> uh it's funny, man. People crack me up, dude. People watch it in Florida. It's, it's fun here. It's an entertaining thing. I should start another page called People Watching in Florida. Dwayne Allman, big influence for Tim. Yep. Is that where, um, I don't know. I don't know Derek's relation to trucks to the almond brother. I know there's something an uncle or something going on that with, with that, but I just, I can't call it, you know, um, exactly what that is, Tim, but yeah, great kid, man. He's nice, dude. Nice dude. <laughs> Frank is on a roll tonight. Good job, Frank. Well done. Well played, sir. Well played. Oh yeah, Hook Life. Um, these things are linked in the bio on my um, what is that page called? Instagram page. You can get to the Shopify uh, link through there, and um, and eventually, I'm actually I got about a thousand more viewer hours. And I will be able to put a shop up on YouTube, and they will be linked up here as well. Um, which will be good because the shop costs me like 40 bucks a month to keep open. And I sell maybe $7 a month worth of these stickers. So, um, it's not a, um, what do they call that? Profitable business endeavor. Yeah. I'll start another YouTube channel called that. This is not going to be a profitable business endeavor. And that will be wildly successful. It's okay if you misspell my name, dude. Everybody does it. Don't worry about it. Everybody does it. Yeah, Hook. Um, honestly, I did look at fish emulsion stuff and then um, said, um, you know what? I'm just going to bury the fish. And... Uh, I can, I, I can honestly tell you too, man, through personal experience. Um, the first time it happened, I would, I would haul fish. Right. And, and I was young, I was just maybe 20 years old, 21, getting a few fish hauling jobs in uh, under my belt, you know, um, stocking fish for different people. And about that time, my younger sister, uh, was, experimenting with planting plants and she planted a rose bush and some other plants around the yard too. But there was this one particular rose bush that she planted in an area that uh, had fill dirt. It was, we had clay here in Georgia. So it's that clay gets rock hard if it's not chopped up and been busted up before. And that particular area of the yard was fill. So even though it was clay, it was fill and, and dig a bowl. Yeah, you know, more diggable than the rest of the yard. So she planted the the rose bush, and then every once in a while, I'd have a few dead fish from a haul or whatever. And uh, in between, in the summers and stuff like that, when I was working at home, at, you know, in between college classes and stuff, and I would bury those dead fish over there in that fill over there near that rose bush. And it didn't take a couple seasons, you know, very long at all, um, several hundred 
small dead fish planted various places around the rose bush. The rose bush was a freak of nature. Um, really did amazing. You know, my mom went was bragging on my sister's ability to grow uh, everything at that point. She's very proud. <laughs> and uh, it took me a while. I didn't really kind of know. I, I didn't really understand. But I figured it out, you know, because the rose bush was obviously like significantly different than the other plants that had been planted. And the rose bush was the only place that I was planting any fish because it was the easiest place to dig. It eventually got out. Um, another side note to that, I used to have a place where I would dump just fish water. There wouldn't even be any dead fish. I would haul fish. I had a small um, spout on a homemade tank, like a like a plug. I didn't want a big hole. The When you built your own tanks, if you had a big hole in the wall and you bumped it, it would bust the tank over those four inch holes. So I just drill holes like, like a hole, um, like at the boat, bottom of the boat, you know, like a boat plug hole about that size. Those wouldn't, those wouldn't have near the effect of the integrity on the side of your tanks on my hand built tank. So I put those small, uh, drain holes down in the bottom, like a boat plug, plug them that way. And, uh, you couldn't shoot the fish down the ramp, but like I said, with the materials I was working with, it was necessary. Anyway, um, I would dip fish out and stock them. So there would be like the fish slime water. There'd be a few dead fish in there too, but there'd mostly just be the water that the fish traveled in. They peed in it and used bathroom in it and slime drop, you know, had slime coat in it, whatever. And I would get home and, and sometimes I'd forget to open up those holes and I'd drive home with full tank and open up those open up that fish water and let it drain just kind of into a side garden right beside the driveway. And just the slime water from the fish made it a completely different universe for that little three foot, four foot strip of garden right in there. Um, it's amazing what fish fertilizer can do for you. It really is. <clears throat> Getting cotton mouth talking too much. bigger glass of water next time. Oh, sure, JB. JB says he's up in Tennessee. Yeah, I've done some, a lot of work in Tennessee, man. The ponds are real similar to North Georgia ponds. Um, so if you have any pond questions or stuff like that, just drop a DM, man. I'll try to help you out. But I'm glad the information helps. Learning some biology about the fish certainly never helps. Um, or never hurts, never helps, <laughs> never hurts, um, to learn a little more science for sure. I found it always has helped me. Oh, I know, man. I'm no expert at anything. I'm an idiot. I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, so Tim said, yeah, he that's right. It's but Derek Trucks is book Trucks's nephew, the drummer. Right. I did know that. I just couldn't remember that. Um actually met Derek's dad there too. Joe? Can't remember. I believe that's Butch's brother. Um but like I said, man, just totally cool people over there, man. We're really, really nice. Um, do, do, talking music, talking music, talking music. All right. How long have we been going? An hour and 23 minutes. <clears throat> well, oh, wait one second. There might be one more question. Pre-spawn? Yeah, man, the pre-spawn's firing up here. And um, I saw um, Florida Bass Mistress had a post on her page. She's already got bass fan in beds down south of here. So it's time to get the pre-spawn action going here in central Florida. It's going to be coming no time. Actually, today was nice. I should have gone fishing today. Um, 
I ended up jacking around. I did a lot of cycling today, so that was good. But it was like 70 degrees today. Um, real beautiful day. It's not going to be that warm tomorrow, unfortunately. But today was was really, really nice weather. Central Florida is beautiful from about October till about mm, around in May. Then it gets really hot. But this time of the year, man, you just cannot beat the weather around here. I can promise you. It's perfect. Enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it immensely. Thanks, Hook Life, man. Appreciate you. He's signing off. We got 12 folks in here. Look at you guys. Appreciate it. I don't see any more questions. And um, I don't know. I think I get brain fried after an hour, hour and a half, man. I just um, I talk until I can't talk anymore. Yeah, Big Malone. I had a kind of off year last year too, man. And part of it was my fault, you know. And part of it was just moving, being in a new environment. Um, part of it's just been not been fishing, you know. That again, that's part of it's my fault. That's the part I'm putting on me as just not being um, fishing motivated. But right now, for me, I've noticed a correlation in my content, the pond content, and I guess the content that's more unique to those types of areas does vastly better for me than just like straight up fishing content. Um, I'm not, you know, you catch a nice fish and you're going to get some views, no doubt. Right. Um, so it's not like I haven't, I'm going to quit fishing. You doing producing fishing content, but like yesterday I tied the fishing content in with doing a pond survey or maybe that was today I posted that. I can't remember. I've got, I'm trying to schedule them out too. That's another thing I think is important on YouTube is um, getting a couple days scheduled out in advance, being ahead of it so it knows it can count on things from you. And then um, I think the algorithm likes to know when things are going to show and how long they're going to be. So I think being consistent with YouTube in those two places is a difference as compared to um, Instagram, it's, YouTube is a different place. <clears throat> I do have a question coming in, Chris. Before I get off, let me. I can't really. I can't really read. What is my preferred uh, chemical to control water primrose? Man, um, water primrose and alligator weeds and all those um marginal kind of plants like that they live in that riparian area can be extremely difficult chris um and normally when in primrose I've had let me, I've had mixed results with primrose. Like sometimes you can just get away with just like straight glyphosate, you know. Um, but generally on those types of plants, I would come at it at different different um, types of problems uh, with with different chemical applications. You might find um, granular two four D combined with like a habitat type product was like a mazapir. Or something like that, you know. Um, and honestly, I'm kind of going back so far. I'm, I've, I've been stayed away from chemical applications. I don't really want to be near pesticides anymore. I don't do treatments anymore. Um, I'm naming chemicals off the top of my head. They might not even be for primrose. I think they are, but I could be wrong, you know. Um, double check your your uh, labels but what i'm getting at is also find um multiple products with the same label and if you need a guy um again hit me on the dm on um probably on instagram is the easiest dm to reach me on and the easiest one that i'll see i've got a guy who can help you with all the newest and latest and greatest he's a distributor for the east coast um those things change quite frequently, like I said, but my experience with any chemical products is find one that works and then find another one that works, especially if 
you are in different treating in different areas of the country, you're going to find different um, habitats, environments, whatever. Uh, some some things will work better in one area than it will in another for different a million different reasons. Um, but on the primrose, you know, you just you could just go with the um, go with the simple and then work your way towards the complex. Does glyphosate not kill it? Does diquat not kill it? You know, those are your first two lines of defense for anybody in the palm business. Um, you, when you use glyphosate in the water, you know, you're going to run into some, you're going to run into some environmental issues with people sometimes, you know, um, you just stay within the rights, you know, within what it says, you know, the EPA has, you know, how much you use and, 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 and how to, you know, protect yourself and protect the environment and everything like that. Um, you know, stay within, don't, don't, don't ever, ever apply, over apply products, herbicides, putting more, it's just like balance really in the pond that we talk about from a fishery standpoint, balance in the environment from a weed standpoint, it's the same way. You don't want to over apply the chemicals. Generally what happens if you over apply chemicals is the plant senses that something bad just got sprayed on it completely just kills and drops its leaf, shuts itself down. The chemicals don't do anything break down. Pond chemicals usually break down in about a week. Most of them anyway, don't stay in the environment very long. Hence the reason why they're used as pond chemicals. And then the plant just throws leaves back up and you literally just burn the leaves off and the root system doesn't go anywhere. And you're right back where you started within a 30 or 45 day period. Um, when you use too many chemicals in the environment, um, I go the other way all the time and try to get away from as much chemicals in the environment as possible. Use grass carp for weed control as much as possible. And, just try to be um, part of being forward thinking or being active. What's progressive? Mm, probably not the right word. Proactive, not reactive to aquatic weed situations. And that comes from experience. Um, so my preferred chemical for primrose has probably been taken off the market 10 years ago, Chris, and I haven't sprayed it in so long. Um, that's the answer to, that's the real answer to your question is I don't even remember. Um, I know we had a bunch of primrose and gator weed together and it was, it was a Mazapir that, that ended up um, dealing the death blow to the gator weed i just can't remember if we had to mix something in the tanks for like something like glyphosate i think maybe it was a mazapir and glyphosate mixed together and i've done a lot of that as well you know where you where you are where you can layer like we said where you can layer the products together um do it and um God, good grief, man. I'm going back so many years now. You know, I could have answered that question maybe 10 years ago much better than I just did. But that was my long-winded answer. Philip is on the spawn mid-February. Yeah, I agree with you on that, my friend. Philip's not too far away from where I used to live in uh, Georgia. It's coming on. It's coming on. <laughs> oh, you guys. You guys are teasing people tonight, aren't you? That'll be all right. All right, boys. Hour and a half. I'm calling it. I'm going to go watch some Netflix. But um, I appreciate everything and what everybody's been doing for sharing this stuff and engaging with this stuff and talking about this stuff. And... Um, Got a lot of cool stuff coming down the line for a show. <laughs> Later, Philip. Yeah, Frank. I'm 
you know, I'll, I might do that, but I might actually have better things to do with my time. And um, <laughs> then troll biologists. That's funny, though. It's a crazy world, man. I don't know. Engagement's engagement, though. Take the good with the bad. <clears throat> Midwest. I was just about to get off. Are you just now arriving? I, I can stay for a few more minutes for Midwest. Yeah, man, we were about to punch this ticket. Big Malone's Debo coming on. Debo says, um, um, Malone says Debo's coming on later, which is probably in about five or 10 minutes. Usually comes on about eight. So, yeah, Midwest, go blue. I am definitely pulling for you boys. Isn't it go big blue? Isn't that how that works? Yeah. I was really glad to see them um, beat Alabama. And I actually, you know, Midwest, since you're here and um, and you brought the football uh, um, emoji and everything, I can I take a few minutes to talk about that right now. Um, I personally feel like Georgia would have stacked up better against Michigan than Alabama did. In watching after watching that game, but I also think Michigan probably would have beat Georgia too. I think, it, but I think it would have been a tough game. Um, like that, you know, like a one score game, but I don't know. I've seen Alabama always seems to do that to us too, where they like somehow have this Herculean effort against Georgia that never existed through the rest of the season. Then all of a sudden we get their best game. Um, Alabama has a phenomenal ability to do that, but they did not have the ability to do it two weeks in a row. And uh, Midwest Big Blue punched them right in the mouth, and I was pulling for it the whole time. I thought it was fantastic. But anyways... Midwest writes in the, uh, the the Bama QB uh, showed how they lost at Texas. Yeah, you know he um, he's a talented kid. You know you can't take it away from him, but um, they just they didn't have that. They didn't have that. I didn't feel like the Alabama that played Michigan was the Alabama that played us. You know, they didn't look the same to me. But that's a testament to Michigan too. Is that defensive line is the business over there? Um, yeah, dude, they hold and stuff. Bama's pretty notorious for pass interference and holding and, and getting away. They just do it so often that they the refs are like, you can't throw a flag every play, you know, and they never do. That's that's pretty normal when you watch an Alabama game. It's usually the pass interference. They will just pillage a receiver before they give up a long play. That Alabama don't give up long plays. They'll tackle your receiver before they ever do that. Uh, you'll get a penalty, but you won't get a touchdown uh, on them. That's that's a Saban thing. He's been, always been that way. You watch, I've watched him a long time. And uh, – but no, I thought that Michigan owned the line. They controlled the line of scrimmage, um, especially like the defensive Michigan's defensive line really looked strong. You know, like they kind of reminded me of what Georgia's defensive line looked like a couple of years ago when they had all like fifteen draft picks off that team and everything. And most of them play for the Eagles now, but. Michigan's defensive line looks really good, man. Like, I think, like I said, I think Georgia's line would have matched up better with them, probably would have challenged them a little bit better than that. But Georgia didn't give up that many sacks. But at the same time, I don't think anybody's got – I think Michigan's defensive line is going to win that. I used to have a buddy who was a tackle for the NFL for a long time. His name was Ed Jasper. And um, he told me he was a defensive tackle, you know, so – the very we fished together and hunted together a lot. He didn't talk football too much, but the very little bit that I talked with Ed about this, it made a lot of sense. And he said that 
if you want to win a championship, either in the college or in the NFL, what you need is good defensive tackles, at least one real good defensive tackle. And he said the reason is because that guy will pull a double team. If you can't stop that one dude, that tackle at the point of attack right there, if he's a if he's a double team type of player, right? He, where you, he ha, you his man can't contain him. He's a butcher. He's rolling ball butcher knives, you know. And you ain't got nothing for that man. You got to double team him. You just freed up a backer. And when you free up backers for places like Michigan and Georgia, that's a world of hurt for you. And that's what Ed always said. Watch the teams with the most dominant defensive tackle. That's probably the team that's going to win, you know, the Super Bowl. That's probably the team that's going to win the national championship and college and that kind of stuff. He said, I remember he said that to me years and years ago. And over the years of, of my, I'm not much of a football fan, but over the years of watching football, man, I found that to be very true. Um, you know, like that Aaron Donald with the Rams, they just won, you know, a couple of years ago, the Rams won the Super Bowl. And if you go back and look, you know, what he said is very true. And, again, the, the two years that Georgia dominated and, you know, got a couple championships, they had an absolutely stacked defensive line that all went to the show. Um, I can't argue with old Ed. I think he had a solid point. Anyway. I am done. Voice is done. Hour and 41 is done, boys. Appreciate everything. And I will be back. Um, I don't know. Maybe, my, maybe do a midweek one again um, and then do another one on the weekend. I caught a couple a couple different people midweek. Um, you know, got some good pond questions in, got some good consulting in, got, you know, help some folks out. And for right now, I think just kind of floating around and doing it, you know, whenever. Um, gives different people different chances, you know, different, everybody's got a different schedule and stuff. So anyway, that's what's happening and I appreciate you fellows. I'll see you next time. Later.